My name is Gil Penalosa. When I lived in Bogota, Colombia, and served as head of parks, I led the construction of over 200 parks, mostly in low-income areas. Now, I live in Toronto, Canada, and 16 years ago created 880 Cities, a non-profit organization based on a simple but powerful concept. What if everything we did in our cities had to be great for an eight-year-old and for an 80-year-old? as indicator species, then it would be good for all. I have been fortunate to have worked in over 350 different cities in all continents. This web talk, A Walk in the Park with Gil, is a way of giving back. Every other week, I invite fascinating people to present captivating stories of parks, people, and cities. Then, you and I have a dialogue with our guests. And we could not have a better guest than having Jan Gell. Jan is a friend from many, many years ago. I admire him tremendously. I have read every one of his books. I, I, every time that I listen to Jan, I learn so much. Uh, and at this moment, when we are going through the pandemic and when we just came out of COP26, what better moment to hear from Jan where is it that we are and where is it that we should be going? What is it that we need to do differently? Jan, thank you very much for having accepted to be our guest. This is magnificent. People from all over the world are anxious to hear your advice. So that was my cue? Yes. <laughs> okay. Does this work? Yes. Can you see my slide? Yes. Can you hear my voice? Yes. Then here we go. Um, we are going to have a walk in the park with Jill Peñalosa. And uh, I have here the start photo from start picture from many of my lectures on livable cities in the 21st century. And as you can see, it's mostly about people walking and maybe people bicycling. As you know, Jill, I've always had a thing with parks and we had a long discussion about what a park is. And let me see what we can do here. Okay. You mentioned my books, and there's one peculiar thing about my books, because there are hardly any reference to parks in any of them. There's hardly a tree in most of them. How does this come? That is all because I, they are all about people. And actually, the effect was that I thought that enough people have talked about parks and plants, and now it was time that somebody should talk about people. Uh, when I was young uh, in architecture, I graduated 1960. I've been out there for more than 60 years. But when I was young, there were many talks, many people talking about landscapes, and many landscape architectures. Architects were around, and they had, of course, a very distinguished profession of landscape architects who did landscaping. But there was hardly any talk about peoplescape or manscape, and people architects did not exist at all. When I looked at my children playing, I could see that they always made nice, walkable, soft cities with winding streets. They were very fascinated by cities. But when I looked out of the window, and that was a time when I wrote Life Between Buildings, I saw what the architects and the landscape architects were making out in our suburbs. They made housing like this. Some put up the buildings and landscape architects came and poured out the landscaping and that was it. There was no people taking care of the people who were to live there and the life which might or might not go on in these places. That from the very start made me very dubious 
about firstly my own profession of architects, how could they do it, but also the landscape architects, why didn't they yell out and say something is missing here? I happen to be able to go and study the life of public spaces in Italy in 1965. And one of the things I noticed in Italy was all these wonderful city squares, they were always squares and there, in many of them there were hardly a tree or they were stony places, but people looked as if they were having a jolly good time. Even in the world famous square of Campo, um, <clears throat> Il Campo in Siena, which I always saw as a miracle. Uh, it was made every eight, 700, 800 years ago, and it's a, the best urban space I know in the world. And again, there were no trees, there were no vegetation, and people were having a good time anyway. Here, people in Siena are having a good time. They've had a good time now for 800 years in a row. And they lean up against the bollards. And that is one kind of public space. No trees here. Also, I could refer to my own home city of Copenhagen, which as all the old cities had no parks. The city was completely built out because they needed a short, the shortest wall possible to defend it. And there was no room for parks. The only park which was in the city of Copenhagen was the king's private garden. All, if there were any more greenery, it would be um, the funeral uh, places. It would be the cemeteries. Just and uh, when people in these dense old cities of Europe, when they wanted to have refreshments and a nice tree walk, they were walking on the wall. So the wall was the park for all these people. And there was a fantastic life on these walls around the cities. And moving around on the wall was called moving, walking on the bulwark. And actually this walking on the bulwark was a way of having a recreational walk. That word later on developed into boulevard, which means a place where you walk for leisure. In Copenhagen, we walked on the wall and there are many references in history and in the songs about how wonderful it was to walk on the wall. On the wall was also the amusement and the entertainment. Um, and in Copenhagen, something happened which was very interesting that a guy, when the walls came down, a guy bought part of the wall where the entertainment used to be. And then he made the amusement park of Tivoli Gardens, which is just in the center of the city, but is an amusement park. Um, and actually it is exactly where the old wall was and actually the little lake in Tivoli Gardens is part of the old moth, which was around the walls of Copenhagen. So this is a reminiscence of how the recreation was done way back. No parks, but walls. But as the times go on, I have added a little extra picture to my start picture, livable cities for the 21st century, will also will be urban spaces and sidewalks and will be bicycle lanes and of course, green recreational spaces. So today I'm going to talk about this parks and city as two different things, the gray city and the green parks. And I'll talk about two very distinct, different ways of using these places. In the city, you do what you have to do. In the park, you go to do what you like to do or you might do, it's not necessary. Much of the things happening in the city are necessary. You have to do it. Much of the things happening in cities are also optional. But most of the things happening in parks are optional. Something you choose to do because you have time and it's a nice day it's not because you are forced to go there, 
but you are forced to use the city. So there's an important difference. And that means that there are much higher degree of necessity in the city spaces than in the parks. Now, Jill are inviting me for a walk in the park. And um, I think of the Toronto parks I know about, and he will probably take me to one of those. If we were in Copenhagen, I would of course take you to the city, to the city street. I think that the city streets are much more interesting and much more rewarding. There are many more things to occupy your mind and to, to dwell with it than in a park because the major interest of other pe of people in cities are other people. And in the city streets, you have this great variety of various people and various activities and so much going on. So there's a difference here. I always thought that maybe the great interest of parks in America is the fact that most of the cities I know from over there are not that nice to walk in or to be in because they are, they are <clears throat> ruined by motor traffic or by poor planning. While we in other places in the, Euro, in the world have celebrated the urban spaces to a higher degree. Maybe that's why we think that a great place to walk is the city street. And maybe that's why you think a great place to, to walk will be a park. It's not against the park. I think park is fine, but cities are also fine and maybe even a shade more fine to walk in than in a park. So the, what I'm going to talk about today is the spontaneous, unplanned, daily day city life. It is an homage to all the small things of life, which are sometimes and most of the time so small that you can hardly no, notice them. But what we know from our studies is that out of the small things can greater events develop from time to time. <clears throat> If we take the Bible of the people landscapes, the death and life of great American cities by Jane Jacobs, 1961, you will at once notice that her first three chapters are on sidewalks. And only in chapter four did she go into talking about neighborhood parks. And most of that chapter is about all the neighborhood parks which doesn't work and then there are a few ones which works. And also, in all the time, she mentioned it's a relation between for the people which makes a neighborhood park work or makes make a neighborhood park doesn't work. Of course, in Toronto, you know a little bit about Jane Jacobs who lived in Albany Avenue. I think it was 66 or 67. And when I was last in Toronto in 2017, I saw this a remarkable uh, posters that Jesus were looking after the end of time while supposedly Jane Jacobs were looking about the future of times. I think this showed how important Jane Jacobs is for this whole movement of hum humanistic city planning. And you can hardly get play more high than being next to Jesus on a poster in, in Toronto. I'll start, I have a few visits ready for you. And I'll start to visit you, to welcome you to the city of Copenhagen. Um, something happened way back at the same time as Jane Jacob was sitting in New York in Hudson Street and writing her Death and Life of Great American Cities. At the very same time, the politicians in Copenhagen took out the cars from the main street, the one kilometer long main street in Copenhagen there was a big fuss about it. Everybody thought it would be a fantastic disaster for the city because we were Danes, we were not Italians, we were not used to urban life. We could not promenade and we had nothing to use public space for. And furthermore, it was too cold. It would be a disaster. It proved to be a fantastic benefit for the city. And very soon we saw this space being used by people in completely new ways. And we saw that we year for year became more and more Italian. <clears throat> my, 
my early studies were very much centered around this street in the center of Copenhagen. We did a lot of studies in Copenhagen that was just outside our windows in the School of Architecture. And I'm just telling you two interesting findings from these studies. The first thing is this street is about a kilometer long. And when we timed it, we could walk the street from one end to the other in 12 minutes flat. And then, of course, we asked people, how long time are you in the street? And the average of people, uh, when you ask them, they will take 20 minutes to go through the street. But then we, of course, had for a long time followed people. We have shadowed them discreetly. And we found amazingly that while people said they were in the street for 20 minutes, the average time of visit in the street was actually 40 minutes. So there was 20 minutes they could not account for. They didn't realize that when they walked through the streets, they did a few stops for shopping or whatever, but then they did a number of other stops <coughs> to see interesting things, to see street, street uh, musicians, to see, see things happening, to sit for a while in the sun. A lot of other things were built up, up on top of just being in the city street. So walking in the city street was much more than walking. There were many other activities and many of them were so small that people did not even detect it and didn't know about it. We found out this very interesting difference between what people thought they did and what they actually did. We also were able in our studies in Copenhagen to prove over a number of years that the more space you laid out for public space, for car-free public space, the more life you had in the city. We even found there was a direct correlation between how many square meters of public space in the city streets and squares you provided and how many people used the city and sat in the city and did other stuff in the city. We always have the saying, what you count, you care for. And typically, no cities had ever counted the city life before we started doing it in Copenhagen. Uh, all the cities were counting all the traffic life. They knew everything about the cars and the traffic, but nobody knew anything about the life of the people. In Copenhagen, we were the first city in the world where the life of the city was documented. And this has been followed up with one survey after the other ever since. And actually in Copenhagen, it came to a situation where the city and university came to work closely together in following the development of the life in the public spaces. And this again led to the politicians being more and more brave in making new public spaces for people better public spaces for people. And all the time we were in the university able to tell them what worked and what did not work. And after a while, they came running over to university and say, what shall we do next? Copenhagen has seen a remarkable development of its people-friendly streets and squares. We have here at the left, we have a situation in 1962 when one street, the main street, was cleared of cars. Now we have a fantastic network of very nice pe people spaces in the city, which are tremendously popular with the population. So we've seen that this phenomena that the more space, the more you invite life in the city, the more life you get in the city. We've seen this very clearly in Copenhagen. We also could see that Copenhagen crept up on the list of most liberal cities in the world. I think it's number four of the fifth time uh, in 221 that Copenhagen um, had the top place in this list from the monocle about world most livable cities. And I'm, queer, I'm, I'm really sure that all the people friendly spaces in Copenhagen and the whole atmosphere in Copenhagen of being a city for people has a very important 
uh, meaning for the people who did these livable cities evaluation. I look at the other cities and nearly all of them are doing quite well or fairly well in exactly this making good cities for people. It's not a matter of how many parks you have, it's a matter of having a nice inviting city for people. Also in Copenhagen, we very, very much found out that life and activity is the finest attraction of all attractions in the city. People were always taking the seats where they could see the other people. And, and, and we have many, many signs that the life of the city was attraction number one. And the more life you had in the city, the more attractive everybody thought the city was. I'll invite you to a new destination, the city of Venice. And of course, for some of you, you will see the Venice as a place for hilarious mass tourism. And of course, mass tourism is a curse of this part of time, this time. And I think it's one of the major problems we face in our cities now, because mass tourism ruined the culture, the identity and the climate. And some parts of Venice is completely ruined by this and the scale is ruined too. But I'll tell you about another part of Venice. That's my Venice. That's a wonderful people city because Venice has this fantastic quality that they never had cars coming into the city. It's still left over as a people city for walking from the medieval time. In Venice, I have a favorite square. It's the best square in the world, in my opinion. It's Campo San Margarita in Dossoduro district. You can see it's a stony square, but there is some trees which are very nice. And it is a fantastic space. Also in Campus San Margarita, I had my favorite one star hotel where I and my family have stayed now for 50 different years. We even have our favorite room up there with this favorite view of the life in the square. There you can really see how a city of people will work. And what is interesting about Venice is because everybody are walking, there are so many social events happening all over in the city. Also the noise level is low and you can see people standing on the bridges and in the squares everywhere. You can see people standing and talking to each other or looking at each other and whatever they are doing. And I also was told that in Venice, everybody is of course 15 minutes late to all appointments because wherever you go, you meet friends. When you meet friends, you have to stop and chat with them for a while. So you always arrive 15 minutes late, which is incalculated in the programs. I could invite you to Melbourne, where we have done a number of street studies over the years. And again, what we did in, in Melbourne and in other places were to sit in the streets from early, from actually from dark in the morning till dark in the evening and just note down everything which happened in a stretch of street. We did this in Melbourne in 20 streets. You can see one of my students is almost camouflaged against the, the light pole. And we noted down everything happening and that was extremely interesting. It's so interesting to go into the details of what, what the life really is in a street or in a park, whatever. What we found most interesting in the street studies in Venice, oh, sorry, in Melbourne, were that most of everything which happened in streets are very minute little things. That 46% of the of the stays, that is people coming out and hanging around or taking a seat, that lasted for less than a minute. They just popped in and out of the houses to see what was going on. And also we noticed a number of social activities, but most of them were minute little things, just a hello or the roses are fine this year or what a nice weather. And then there were other ones Many times the same people 
in the afternoon, uh, when they returned from work and had more time, they would talk for links with the same people they just said hello to. So the little things happening in the street has a very important meaning for the bigger things, the more solid friendships and, and uh, relationships. But the little things were by far the most frequent. Also, we found a number of funny uh, activities where people pretended to do something which they did not do as a pretext for being out in the street and having one conversation after the other. This lady, she swept her sidewalk for three hours in a row. And that was a very small little sidewalk, but she had 20 conversations in that period of time, street life. Later on, I had the chance to repeat this kind of street life studies in the Toronto area, Kitchener, Waterloo and Toronto. I lived in Toronto in 1972, 73, and that was maybe the best year we had spent uh, as a family of all the years. It was a fantastic year. We came to be half Canadians and we loved Canada for many reasons. We lived in an area with nice porches and we had the chance to see what the porches could do and how life was going on. It was very much like the Australian row house areas. Here's a little street ballet. Of course, Jane Jacobs, she mentioned very many of the small things happening and she had this, this word street ballet to tell about the small things of life. Here is our house to the left and the neighbor's house and then some other neighbors come by and then my little son comes over and sit and show his nice new drawing and a little party has happened with cookies on the neighbor's porch. All these small things of life we saw there. Also in Toronto, I had, of course, we were all facing the street with porches and whatever, and we had the backyard facing the backyard of the other, from the other street. But we never knew who was living on the other street. We always knew all the people who knew who lived on our own street. We knew many of them. And this is a study by Holly White showing that who has parties in Chicago. And it's very evident that those people who have parties and know each other are those who share the street. It's the front door, which is a main thing the main place in any housing area, that's where you pass the most of times. You know, also we did studies in Copenhagen, found that row house streets with front yards, they had about twice as many, more than twice as many activities and more life than those who had no soft edges. We started the soft edges in the old districts in Copenhagen, and we also started the life and soft edges where they were made in new housing districts in Copenhagen area. I shall tell a little bit about um, what we have found in all our studies is what is very easy to do, you do more of. And I'll tell you this little example. I, uh, at one time in my life, I started to do the trombone and uh, when the trombone was in its case, it was quite a bigger work to, to unfold it. First, you have to unfold the music stand, it takes a long time. Then you have to open it and tune in the trombone and get the right <coughs> score for exercising, whatever. And then you could do your exercise, your training. <clears throat> but of course, I noticed that when the trombone was lying open, ready to go, tuned in, the music stand ready, and then you were sitting doing this, this silly lecture for Jill Penalosa in to Toronto. And then suddenly you hear in the radio, maybe a nice uh, solo by Louis Armstrong, whatever. And then you you a little bit bored and you, you, what, you see the trombone and then you have this urge to go over and do a little bit, feel, feel, uh, fit in to the tune of of uh, Armstrong and 
then you get fired up and you do three more tunes and then you have bad conscience and go back to the lecture and you leave the, the trombone ready. But I found that when the trombone was ready to go, I in one week would do nine times more exercise and practice than when you have to make a plan, a decision about now it's time to do exercise with the trombone. Now I must unpack it and afterwards I will pack it up again much more complicated. When it's easy, you do it more. <clears throat> also, we found that living in the ground floor, you can just breathe in and out very easily. You don't have to plan anything. But if you live high up, you have to plan all the outings. You have to pack a bag. You have to take your radio and you have to take whatever you need, your newspaper, and go down and do some recreation, maybe in the outdoor spaces, in maybe in the park. And then you go up again and close your door, lock your door. That's completely different from breathing in and out. We've also found in these studies that the lower you live, the more you get in and out and the more you participate in neighborhood life. It's all that the trombone here is not wrapped in a case. It is open, ready to do for those who are living low. Uh, those who are living higher has a completely different situation. Whenever they go out, they have to plan it. And that means they go out much less. And when they're out, they may be out a bit more. But it's a completely different thing from just going in and out. That is this planning and going out to do some recreation or to do some of this or the other. We found in these studies that half of all the outdoor activities in a residential area is actually generated by the people living in the two lower floors, especially ground floor, if the, they have a soft edge. Who did these studies? That was actually a young a student of mine who was always carrying my books around, did many of the layouts of the books. And now, lo and behold, she is the city architect of Copenhagen. She knows how to make a people-friendly city. And today, <coughs> soft edges, which we know is very important, is incorporated. Actually, it is a must in all new housing in Copenhagen. Gray of green, or a bit of both, some conclusions. I think that's all the time we have as profession and as, as individuals we are, it's easier to see the big events and to plan for them and observe them. It's much easier to see this kind of events. It's easier to see a park or a sports stadium than to see the street ballets and all the small little things which makes up a good neighborhood and a good city. But each of these are important. And I would even say that the small things are more important than the big things. Also, after our studies of all these entrances, whatever we found that one square meter close to the entrance of your house is invariable, more useful than 10 square meters around the corner. And it's all about the, the trombone being ready to be used right away when you get inspiration from hearing a good jazz tune in the radio, instead of having to plan for the recreation and plan for the walk in the park and whatever. Also, it's important for me to point out that there's much more to walking than walking. You can never look at the city and see there's much walking in that city, so it must be a good city. The many the high level of walking could only be because the university is far away from the railway station or something. What is really interesting in the city is to notice where the, where the people stop walking and start to enjoy. So always watch where people have stopped, what is happening, and the ones who are not walking are always the more interesting to find out about than having more people walking. But both are things of the same coin. They are two sides of the same coin. There's much more to walking than walking. Actually, we found 10 activities which are based on you walking in the city. So 
We have found that life and activity is the finest attraction of all. And the gray or green, the grand finale, what I would urge you to do is make walkable cities, cater for the little things of life and add some parks for good measure. And then how to do it? Yeah, there are a few books available which have very good recipes of how to do it. And it appears that Island Press has this New Year's gift for you. I wish you all the best in studying street ballets and the small things of city life and parks. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Jan. It's been amazing. You have helped create cities for people all around the world and you have planted seeds that are germinating everywhere and they will continue to germinate for many, many, many years. And let's hope that in the future, we, we focus more. We know this is not a technical issue. You have provided multiple, many, many, many ideas what needs to be implemented. Uh, so it's clearly not a technical issue, it's not a financial one, it's a political one, but not of political parties, but of people, uh, of policies, uh, of principles, and let's hope that we'll end up with cities that are more so equitable and more sustainable, where all people will be able to live healthier and happier. Yeah, and thank you very, very much. I wish you a fantastic 2022 and all the best to your granddaughter. I hope you bring your musical group because you, the, the group is amazing and she will be very proud and very happy to have you and your music. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill, and thank you to everyone. It's as always a great pleasure to be speaking in Canada, where I have half of my heart. Thank you. <laughs>